Yeah, it is. It, it was a weird statement, though, in that um, it was clear that they were bowing to a lot of corporate pressure, but were not committing to anything. So. Yeah. And, and there was a weird uh, thing they added at the end. It was like, you know, we need to honor natives um, and the military. And it was like, <laughs> military. Yeah. How exactly does that fit in with this at all? Uh, <laughs> very unclear. But the football that, team from Washington has a deep military history of well, yeah. oppressing Native Americans. I, I don't understand. <laughs> I think that was their both sides attempt right there. They were like, We'll throw a little to the left and then yeah. throw the word military. <laughs> well, the, the NFL does get buckets of money from the Department of Defense, right? Um, yeah. To promote. I mean, have... there were a couple exposés about that a few years ago, right? Yep. So. And they have recruiters coming in, right? Mm -hmm. Like military recruiters show up at NFL games all the time. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. So, well, luckily, right. um, I, I was I was loyal. I was born in Queens, so uh, the Mets were my my easy option there. And then, um, yeah, uh, and then I was too stupid to change my affiliation at a young age. So, I'm just gonna. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you have. I mean, there's there's something about a mantle, right? Uh, wearing a mantle of of uh, being a fan of a long suffering team, too. For right? a story. especially if it's your hometown team, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So makes perfect sense um yeah i don't have but, any favorite american teams i think the only team i actually care about um is the indian cricket team <laughs> it's about it i have no other favorite teams i enjoy watching um uh anytime curry's playing like steph curry i yeah i, I guess i'm a bay area native now i can i can root for them <laughs> you absolutely can though they're they're <laughs> traitors and they moved across to the other to the bad side of the bay um, recently, yeah. so yeah. Um, you can hold that against them, but um, yeah. but but maybe we should we should move on if that's all yeah. right. So and Let's we'll begin. get going. So um, thank you everyone for joining us um, here in Drinking with Historians. Um, we are are pleased to to welcome Dr. Gautam Rao uh, from American University, and um, I am of course of Matt, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Varsha to get us going. Yeah. So. Uh... You know, Gotham is a historian at American University, but he specifically works on, you know, legal history, early American legal history. My favorite book is his first book, National Duties. I remember that's actually how, no, I mean, not like my favorite book ever. It's like, yeah, okay, good. Top, top 10, top 10. Um, <laughs> that's pretty I good. I remember that's like, that's sort of how I got into legal history. I was reading it in an American history survey. Um, but now you're working on a couple of other books. You're working on the state and slavery. Uh, I think it's called Slavery is Leviathan. And you're working on how Americans sort of like think about political drama. It's called the West Wing's history. Um, and I guess my, my first question uh, for everyone is uh, what are you drinking? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, what are you drinking? I have an enormous chalice of red wine um, <laughs> here. I'm going to show you how big that is because I, I, I'm in my parents' house and I felt really weird just bringing the bottle up here and, and having dainty pours. Um, so I was like, I'll just, and my kids are running around outside. They're very curious as to what's going on in here. So I thought that just one enormous pour would be, um, would be sufficient. So. That's, uh, I consider fair. myself a very friendly bartender tonight uh, for myself. Nice. <laughs> well, I'm you having be... baby bourbon Go ahead. again. Baby yeah, bourbon again? Hudson. Yeah, it's, it's are... become one of my favorites. You've, I see you have the larceny bottle there too, but um, you know, I think it is important to have have your favorites. I would say too, like, don't be afraid to bring the bottle next time yeah. because I mean, <laughs> it's yeah, it's just easier to do that. Um, so I ran a little Twitter poll to see what people wanted. They voted for for Woodbur Woodford um, bourbon, which which I do have. But actually, I made myself a cocktail because I was thinking about um, uh, something themed related to um, to our conversation today. Since we're going to be talking about kind of legal history, American history, it is the Fourth of July. We may bring up Trump at some point, President Trump at some point. And so the cocktail I found is called a Taste of Treason. Ah. Oh, um, wow. Which is um, which is rye and apérol and a little bit of, of dry vermouth. It's a it's a variation on another kind of cocktail called the 1794, which is named after the Whiskey Rebellion. So um, so I thought it was appropriate, so cool. and it's it's super delicious. So wow, that's really neat. yeah. Um, so now, Jotham, I guess we should we should probably talk about history as, as we we continue to drink. And you you slug down that enormous um, 
a glass of, of red wine. So, so can you tell us a little bit more about these new projects? Um, you know, Varsha mentioned your first book, which is already out, and then you have these two projects. Are they kind of related? Are they separate projects? Like, how do they, what are you doing with those? So totally separate projects. Um, one uh, has been kind of the first thing I got into in grad school uh, was about the slavery and the law, uh, the public law of slavery. And I was really interested in how the literature was kind of portraying the the North is developing this kind of strong governmental tradition and then slaveholders in the South as being kind of anti-statist. And the more I dug into it, the more I, uh, I saw that couldn't be true because they had all these laws that were about regulating slaves. And um, so I started to put it together and uh, I was originally going to just write a book about runaway slave laws that went, went from mm -hmm. roughly 1619 to about you know, 1865. But then uh, given the world we live in, it was really hard not to see the connections between um, the kind of police institutions that came out of slavery and then yeah. the racialized police regimes of Jim Crow um, and, and real persistence in that when you get to modern police forces, I think. So uh, I'm now carrying the project into the 20th century uh, with, uh, as, as the publishers say, a very suggestive postscript, I think that will <laughs> that will uh, try and uh, do a lot of work for me, getting more uh, closer to the present. Uh, but that's kind of the idea behind it. It's really looking at um, not only the laws themselves, but also I'm really interested in how uh, uh, free white uh, labor was coerced by the state in order to solve the problem mm -hmm. of runaways and rebellion. Um, because it, it, it is a kind of contradictory uh, a political economy to what you might think, right? Where uh, it's the whites who are doing the coercing, uh, but in fact, in order to sustain the system, um, you, there had to be significant coercion upon uh, so-called free men uh, and free people as well. So that's kind of where that project is. Uh, the West Wing stuff is totally out of nowhere. Um, I, I teach uh, a class called the West Wing is History, and it's probably the most popular class I teach at American. Um, it's a lot of fun, too, because you get to watch a lot of TV, which I'm all for uh, in all aspects of life. Um, but in this case, <laughs> students really got into it, and my lectures got more and more complicated. And uh, finally, I got an approach from a publisher who said, oh, we noticed you're doing this book. Uh, a couple of New York Times reporters asked me about it as well. And I said, yeah, there's like interest in this. So um, I started working on an idea for a book and it kind of blossomed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's looking at um, both the show, how it refracts uh, historical moments uh, mm -hmm. into its plot lines uh, and what it's trying to say uh, about a sort of grander American narrative, but also about the, the direct history about the 1990s um, and how uh, Aaron Sorkin and others involved in the show trying to repackage that into uh, the world they would have wanted. And then finally, the legacy uh, of that in modern, um, modern politics or contemporary politics. There's, a, there's a, a very large genre now of West Wing haters who blame it for, you know, Trump. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of low hanging fruit yeah. for, for uh, yeah. a project like this. I'm, I'm interested in mainly like the idea that you know, the West Wing is to blame for a certain number of people's like optimism about politics or their, their interpretation of politics. So, but when you study the 1990s, what do you think, like, why do you think the people, the way that people in the 2000s after, you know, after 1990s ended, have this like optimistic, nostalgic perspective of the 1990s, similar to how like a lot of people view the 1950s, depending yeah. on who you are. Yeah, I think, um... It's a very difficult question to pin down, uh, but I think it's pretty generational. And if you look at cultural uh, sense of cultural belonging, you see a pretty parallel thing, you know, things like music taste, for instance. Um, you know, uh, my wife and I last night uh, were uh, shamelessly watching a show about 90s music videos on VH1, which is the only place you can find that kind of programming. Um, and we were laughing at how bad the videos were. And we're like, I remember it being very different, you know, like there was a, I think a Backstreet Boys I refuse video. to believe they're bad. 
by the way. But continue, please. I mean, I just I would urge the audience, uh, if you haven't seen it, to um, watch the I Want It That Way video of Backstreet Boys. Uh, <laughs> because you will be appalled at the, the, the repeated feature of luggage carts in that show, in that uh, video is, is striking. Um, but uh, I think the, the nostalgia about politics is similar. The, the Clinton thing, you know, um, both left and right, because the Clinton so-called revolution unseats a, a dynasty in a lot of ways, right? And then the Gingrich uh, revolution unseats this long democratic majority. And so I think there's this sort of nostalgia about it, about it that, that comes from those big pivotal moments. But then, you know, the scholarly literature is so uh, now tied into showing how that was actually a moment of continuity with, with what came before. Um, so, you know, for a historian now looking at both, trying to put them in dialogue with each other, it's kind of, it was very interesting to me. And for someone who's only done stuff on early America, I'm like, oh, all this, these, you can read all this stuff, but you don't need to spend 10 minutes figuring out the handwriting. And oh my gosh, there's video as well. Wow. <laughs> um, it's quite liberating, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, well, as, just, as a medievalist, I can absolutely sympathize, but, but please yeah. go ahead, Marcia. Yeah. Just a quick question about your, your first um, book, right? So your first book is on custom houses. It's national duties. How did you get from, how did you get from grad school to studying taxes and then now studying the legal history of slavery? Just, just sure. wondering, is there a connection there for you or like were these two disparate things or do you think there's like a connection, a deep connection between studying taxes and, and studying slavery in, in early America? There's definitely a connection in terms of those two projects. Um, in both, I guess I'm a little bit of a contrarian, um, you know, where uh, I'm trying to, to tackle these bigger um, assumptions about uh, governance in early America in particular, that it was a, a kind of, to some extent, people look at it as a, as a, uh, a less developed, um, less regulated society. And uh, I think scholars have been great about showing how that was not true in the North when it came to um, things like the economy, you know, there's laws about everything um, and there's economic activity, uh, regulatory activity everywhere. But um, there was this huge, uh, you know, concept that before the New Deal, the federal government was kind of insignificant. Um, there was a big part of the literature, uh, the state of courts and parties and all this stuff. And I, I just refused to believe it. Um, and uh, you know, I was like, why are all, why is the central question of American politics in in the 19th century the role of the federal government if it was doing nothing? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, and so, the more I got into that, the more I started seeing this incredible activity that was slightly under the radar, slightly uh, not formal. Um, and uh, with the slavery stuff, you see a similar. There's a bit of a nexus there where you definitely see a conjunction, uh, conjuncture between the, the world of the plantation, which is largely uh, regulated by what the master uh, and, and, and envir overseer, et cetera, want, but also what oligarchs want, right, who are running the state. And so the convergence of those worlds is something I'm really interested in, um, in, in that context. So there's definitely a methodological thing uh, that connects the two. Uh, if I had a fancy word for it, I would write an article about this, but I don't. Uh, just yet. Well, I've always been told the historians don't like to do theory or methodology. Really, anyway, <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's that's fair, right? So, um, so I mean, what kind of following up on that? I, I think that it seems very interesting that that, and this has been kind of common about uh, some of the the guests that we've had on previous episodes of this on drinking with historians is, um, you know, your work seems to stand kind of at the confluence of a couple of different kind of subfields within history, right? Like we tend to think about these things sometimes as like political history, cultural history, social history, economic history, environment, whatever. Um, but, you know, this this project, especially as you, you're talking about kind of moving between projects, especially, is that it, it's bringing together a lot of different things. I mean, like, has that caused any difficulties? I mean, has it made it more interesting? Like, do you agree or disagree? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's made it much more difficult. Um, complexity breeds complexity, right? Um, yeah. And uh, it's really hard to write sentences um, at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, in, especially in the current environment, uh, writing yeah. is a real challenge. But I find myself uh, really struggling with, you know, I, well, with the slavery project, first of all, I started that in 2001. And I wrote an article that I, that, you know, I, I really liked it and it was great and came out in 2008. 
Um, but, but so much has come out about slavery and law since 2008. And I find I spend half my time just trying to catch up. Uh, I'm so, so out of it uh, that uh, it takes so long. So, uh, and in part theory has come into play with that. The slavery capitalism literature, for instance, right, is, is mm. pretty theoretically involved. Yeah, of course. Connected to a whole apparatus, explanatory apparatus, which you have to sort of uh, figure out first and then, and, and then try to situate your own story within. Um, and I think, you know, also even beyond that, just taking slaveholders seriously as a political group um, is, is a thing that is now occurring um, that just it, the, the literature was not not there in 2001. So um, that's been a real challenge for me. Uh, I'm not the fastest writer to begin with. Um, I tend to, I, I, I have a, very, a severe problem of self-critique, I would call it. Um, <laughs> and so usually I'll write something, get mad at myself and, and just put it away for a while. Uh, and that that's no longer a possibility given life constraints. So I have to just write things I'm not happy with and move on. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the, you know, on the one hand, you get a much better literature. And I think what I'm working on now is probably a lot more sophisticated than the article I wrote back in 2008. But uh, it is it is a real challenge. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the key is really is just to have no standards. So yeah. I think that's, yeah. that's really, I mean, and, and, you know, given some of the statements that some public historians have made yeah. on TV, I'm thinking of the experience exceptionally racist David Starkey, for example, yeah. recently, um, you know, just that's a very easy way to get around that. So. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you hear these historians or, uh, you know, critics of historians rather uh, go on TV or whatever, Twitter, and, and uh, they're so concerned about the standards of the field. Uh, and I'm like, have you met actual historians? Because all we talk about, <laughs> all we obsess about is like, you know, detail and standard and, and uh, you know, the amount of times at conferences, I end up talking to people about the challenge of, oh, we, my editor made me cut X amount of notes out. And will people take the book seriously if I don't <laughs> yep. take citation in one footnote, you know, uh, the trauma that has been visited upon us by, by uh, that world is something. So, uh, yeah, real mystery to me what, uh, who they're talking about or to, but maybe a little projection yeah. involved, who knows? I had to, so my recent, uh, so in grad school, you have to write two research papers. One of my research papers is not really about my dissertation at all. And it basically was a legal history of this court case. Um, but as I was researching it, I got really into the legal history, like the legal historiography of how the field has sort of evolved. And I sort of ended up at um, the critical legal studies movement. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess my, uh, without having to define that for people, because it's not really relevant to the question, my my question is do you get to teach legal history at all and when, when you do how do you go about teaching it like what what is the most important thing for legal historians to understand is it the institutions or is it legal pluralism which is how people are changing these laws or is it the common law like what makes american legal history important and useful to know about yeah great question um i have i used in my previous job at ngit Rutgers, i taught a lot of legal history uh, and that was pretty cool. Uh, I actually missed that job a lot in a lot of ways because the students were very different. Um, backgrounds were very different and a lot of science students who had never taken humanities. So like teaching, you know, they thought they'd be really bored out of a, a class about the law, but uh, turns out uh, that they would never be. Uh, I had little exercises to keep them interested. But um, at American, I'm, I'm more of an early Americanist who also teaches a lot of other things. So uh, I have not yet had the chance to, to teach legal history uh, on its own, but I work it into pretty much everything. Um, so in my early Republic classes, uh, for instance, I'll always work in um, uh, a comparison between uh, law uh, cases about uh, slaves, enslaved people who are uh, either hurt or killed uh, labor dispute type things, running away versus industrial accidents in the early Republic and how judges sort of deal with those. Uh, the language is shockingly similar uh, and it allows an opportunity to, to open up to talk about the two uh, competing systems, to what extent they're connected, uh, labor, class, these sorts of issues. So, uh, but when I teach it, when I get a chance to teach it more broadly, um, then I do take an approach, uh, a very, I, I think Dirk Hartog's article, Pigs and Positivism, is really uh, yeah. still, you know, a real classic, but it's, it's really my departure, uh, uh, jumping off point for the course, where I really want them to see 
two parallel worlds at least in operation and one is that appellate law world uh, where you're going to get uh, formal legal adjudication of issues and the other is much more defined by norms um, and when the, when those two worlds come into conflict i think you get the most or or not conflict but with touching each other at least then you get some really fascinating moments that uh, make for uh, great organizational points for a course uh, and that's what i try to do it around um, I'll give you an example that I've been working on. Uh, I was slated to teach this course in the spring. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but um, the whole controversy about the 1619 project um, yeah. and the question of to what extent slavery was baked into the Constitution, to what extent the Constitution was protecting uh, the institution, uh, it should be institutions of slavery, but um, you know, that is kind of a false question because um, you know, it's undeniable that there are things in the Constitution that address slavery but is that really why slavery is protected, right? And I think that is a, is a moment to be able to see, well, on the one hand, state governments have enormous apparatuses that are governing slavery and seeking to expand it, right? Entire political economic systems in state and municipal governance in the South. Um, and so you put that in conjunction with the formal protections, you know, the, the Fugitive Slave Clause, Three Fifths, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it kind of makes much more sense than, if, than isolating the question down to, is the Constitution the key question here? Uh, to me, the Constitution is part of a much bigger story um, about it. So that allows me to reframe the, the whole issue uh, to show just the magnitude of slavery um, uh, in connection with the law, not just the high, higher realms of, of the law. Speaking of, um, go ahead, oh, go ahead, go ahead Matt. Oh, I was oh, well, just say, like speaking of like representations of sorry Matt. I'm speaking of representations of like history and pop culture, the 1619 project is like a really great example. But there's um, another thing going on tonight that I don't know if people are going to see. But Hamilton, like the musical, has finally been filmed and it's streaming on I think Disney or uh, Plus or something. I was just wondering what is the worst or or best movie or book about your research area, like early America in general or legal history that you've seen. And follow-up question, is Hamilton on that list or is it not on that list? This might be a setup, uh, but I'm not sure. But um... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we're going to judge you. I'm a medievalist, but, and that's why I can't judge you, but yeah. So uh, there aren't many, uh, many movies that I think are great on this. I think Django is probably the one I would say is, is the most powerful to me um, because you see um, resistance and contests. Uh, it's not it's not a kind of one-sided power dynamic. Um, so yeah, but I'm not a huge, I, I'll be honest there, I'm not a, I'm not a huge, um, uh, you know, I don't watch a lot of movies uh, because I have kids and I have to watch what they want. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, Hamilton, I have, I'm of two minds on. So I have a fairly, <laughs> legendary dislike of musicals um, that um, oh, no. that is that is deep and um, will never be changed. Um, to me, I mean, hiking and musicals are like probably my least favorite activities that you could possibly make me do. Um, so uh, <laughs> Hamilton, <laughs> I've had to make peace with Hamilton because it is so deeply, um, uh, has so deeply influenced the the field in which I, I work. And so I've listened to the songs and I find the songs interesting. The lyrics are great. I find the whole project is, I have nothing bad to say about it, other than the fact that I think Hamilton was not a great guy. Uh, <laughs> and that Aaron Burr probably gets a bad rap, but um, you know, I, I don't love it, um, but I, I've grown to tolerate it. But any other musical, you know, you re really would have to either pay me significant amounts of money or um, or coerce me in some way uh, to to be witness to it. No, that makes sense. So, I haven't watched Cats, and I don't I don't plan on watching Cats ever. Don't. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I mean, you really shouldn't. Uh, I, although I will say, I heard the movie was so bad that I'm I'm slightly I have a macabre now kind of interest in it. You know, I don't think I could sit through the whole thing. But if it was that bad, I you know. There's always YouTube clips. I mean, you could just, you could just do that. So I think it's, I think it's fine. Um, you know, leaving aside musicals, though, is that, I mean, you know, 
you were talking about kind of uh, the West Wing as the show, right? Is that, you know, you seem to um, be very interested. And then even in, in your, sorry, this is, this is going to be a kind of a rambling question because we're almost into the second part of the show, which my wife insists we call Drunk With Historians. Ah. Um, so I'm almost there. Um, but, uh, you know, you mentioned even in, in your, your, your slavery project, like an extended postscript or suggestive postscript, right? And connecting these things, even from the early American Republic, like into the present day and, and talking about kind of this, this kind of boogeyman that, that historians always have to confront this this relevance question, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so how do you how do you kind of kind of deal with that? Like especially as an American historian, somebody who works on issues that are absolutely and, and we'll get to the, the the Trump thing maybe in a little bit. Um, it, you know, dealing with things that Americans are are really confronting right now that are in the news. Like how do you how do you kind of work with that and and kind of manage both kind of student expectations or, or kind of popular expectations with scholarly rigor and and the things that historians like you said kind of kind of do like worrying about footnotes being cut and things like that yeah that's a great question and uh, it does i mean it does get at one of the major uh structural problems in the field right now right which is mm. i think you know in a lot of ways the uh the world in which we live in terms of economic funding uh fiscal funding for uh, academic institutions it, it's a zero-sum game right if if one field is benefiting another is not and i think the stem emphasis in, in the last lord knows how long has really come at the cost of the humanities humanities are in this perpetual crisis now uh and and the only way out is apparently as you suggested to to um prove relevance right um, and that's such a dangerous uh, path to walk because, um, you know, you really are opening yourself up to, to possible um, critiques that are so powerful that uh, not much you can do about it. Uh, legal history is in a very, uh, a really interesting position there because, you know, when you go to a law school job talk, uh, the main question is about the normative claim that someone's making. It's not how great is this history? You'll get some of that too. But the real important point is that the law faculty has to buy into is why should we care about this? What's the big point for contracts or appellate law or whatever? You know, we, we need to know why this matters. And so you have to make that connection. Um, those of us teaching history departments don't necessarily have to do that. Um, so I try not to do it excessively in my own work. Um, the first book I didn't, I didn't say, look, your anti-tax fixation America is crazy because um, that's never been how it was. A little bit of subtext there, but that, you know, I didn't, I didn't come out and say that. The slavery project is, is much harder to not do that because I do see a continuum between the practices around enslaved people in, in the 18th and 19th century and then racialized policing in the, in the 20th. Um, in the classroom, it's an entirely different thing, and I have no qualms with using the present as a hook in order to get students interested in the past. Uh, and so I might overdo that, um, frankly, in my own uh, curriculum. Um, I'm planning a course, in fact, that has no syllabus that will be called the history of the present, um, in which we as a group, the students and I, will decide the readings for the following week, uh, kind of on the fly, based on contemporary um, political crises uh, globally. Um, Everyone I've mentioned this to in my university has not been a fan of it. Um, so it might be, a, <laughs> might be a long time coming. Um, but I think it would be fun. And I think it would be yeah. a great way to get students to see, uh, at the very least, that history provides a context for understanding, if not the lessons, right? Uh, that part I'm a lot, a lot less interested in. So that, that's kind of my approach to it. Um, there's a little uh, trickery involved, admittedly, but... I'm willing to live with that if uh, if uh, it gets a couple students interested in history. Yeah, that no, that sounds like a really cool class. Mainly because I mean, given 2020 is one political crisis on each continent almost daily, I feel like the types of readings you and your students can choose in 2021 are pretty vast. You know, there's Brexit on one side, there's crises all around, all over South and North America. So I think. That, that was what was the most useful for my, I took a history and public policy class. And the most useful thing that I learned out of that was that history provides a much better context for creating public policy than just the solutions. It's not like you're Cassandra and you can predict the future. It's more that 
you can finally understand all the different options in front of you because you have a better understanding of where all these options came from. Uh, I think that's that's why legal history attract I'm attracted to legal history is because even if it's not just a history of the courts, when you're looking at like legal history is like of various laws or even individual people and how they interacted with the law, like um, Din Dylan Penningrot's claims of kinfolk, when you're looking at stuff like that, you see that like law is more than just what the Supreme Court or what various legislators hand down, it's more what people make of it. Um, and I think that's why your book project on slavery and like white labor is, is very interesting. Um, and sorry, got out of track there. I was just wondering um, when it comes from, when it comes to not just TV shows, but you were talking about how critics of historians like to go and, you know, talk, worry about standards of history. I was just wondering as a historian of, you know, legal historian and historian of slavery, how do we get away from this like bad history, right? Not just like uh, Democrats are the real racist type history, more like people who don't understand how pervasive slavery was to early American history, people who don't understand that slavery was central in the cause of the Civil War. Like, how do you, how do you think that we can move away from that type of stuff? I mean, that is a question that's probably best aimed at people who are teaching K through 12, um, to be honest, because that yeah. I think is where you're forming a lot of the key opinions. Um, at the college level, I, I mean, American is, is a campus where I find, I don't think I've had any students who come in with, with such profound disinformation about the past, uh, maybe a couple times, but for the most part, not so much. In fact, the problem we find is that they all come in with like AP credits. And so they know all these like narratives, but they don't know like where, what Fort Sumter is. They're like, what happened there? And they're like, I don't know, but you know, they, they'll tell you that uh, the Civil War was absolutely about slavery and uh, they, they know, you know, all this sort of fairly arcane detail uh, about, about the story, but the, the details of like actual events. So I find myself doing a lot of that in the classroom. Um, geography quizzes, for instance. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, no, otherwise though, I, you know, this is, I have a bit of a, a whole spiel, which I try not to do the whole thing on here, but I think the publishing industry is also deeply complicit in this problem in that it is very easy to understand that the money is there to be made for another book about Antietam um, or another book about, uh, you know, the Boston Tea Party, right? But, uh, and, and, you know, I don't begrudge people who are, who are trying to make a living doing these sorts of things, not at all. Uh, but I think that it does put um, academic historians at a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to uh, publicizing their work. Uh, there are kind of choke points into getting, getting one's work out there to be able to be seen. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the New York Times Book Review, they, they create great book reviews, but they're not really reviewing books that are doing cutting edge history for the most part. They're occasionally, yes, but for the most part, it's here's another book by a historian who's written 20 books. And it's kind of the same thing, slightly new topic. Uh, and here's a reviewer who isn't that interested in telling you this, the backstory of the literature and blah, blah, and all this stuff. So um, it's a real challenge, uh, both bottom up and, and top down. And I don't really have answers to that, but I do think the internet and, and social media has been, um, you know, you know in, every, in many ways toxic, so many ways toxic, <laughs> but in this one minor specific way, <laughs> has had a very good impact. Uh, and I would look at the, the Made by History project that uh, Washington Post does, look at the Atlantic, their, uh, their uh, friends contributing there, the New Yorker as well. Uh, obviously, uh, Lepore's work stands out um, in that, in that uh, magazine. But there's definitely been, I think, democratize is, is not the right word at all because it's false, but there's been something um, happening in the last couple of years where you're starting to see more and more uh, academic historians who are being brought into discussions of public policy, contemporary issues. So hopefully that's an ongoing trend um, uh, that, uh, that we see uh, for a while. But um, yeah. yeah, it's a very, very vexing problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting thing that you bring that up too. I mean, like part of this this whole um, webcast, not not a podcast, not a podcast uh, that that we're doing with drinking as historians, right? It was, was formed on Twitter, right? Is because Varsha and I have never actually met in in real life, but we we've corresponded over Twitter, and and um, 
you know, have talked about the importance of these types of things. And like, even just, you know, in the last few days, I think there, there've been, um, it, it's not just historians who are better kind of are reaching out, but about journalists who are kind of yeah. reaching towards the academic sphere, who are looking for experts and realizing because of this engagement, like you said, on social media, that, that we're here, we're willing to talk, we're happy to talk about these types of things because this is what we do and we're excited about it and we're interested in it. And, you know, we can connect you with, with resources and, and kind of fill these things, um, fill these things in. So, um, so, and with that, that, that kind of awkward thing right there that uh, I think we'll transition to, to, to take some questions from, from our, um, our audience here, uh, a lot of questions about Hamilton, if that's okay. So, um, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's just kind of in the cultural ether there. The biggest question is, is something you mentioned earlier is like, why did Aaron Burr get a bad rap? Um, I mean, that was more of a provocateur kind of statement I wanted to make. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, no, but you know, no, I, tell I, us why I, there should be a bird uh, musical. Maybe this is your chance, man. Actually, there really should be a bird musical, and I think it would. Okay. Be, uh, I think it would be a lot more. There would be a lot to do there, um, and there would be incredible creative license because we don't know so much. Um, so you know, what happened out in the West? <laughs> you tell us, creative producer. You know, um, bring some pirates in. Who knows? Um, so uh, Burr, I think. Is, he's a fascinating figure. Uh, one of the, he gets caught up in um, the kind of patriotic Hamilton narrative, you know, where Hamilton, founder of nation, uh, and, and so Hamilton's fate is the nation's fate uh, to some extent, and Burr is seen as treasonous and all sorts of stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, probably there's some of that there, um, but the world in which you lived, you know, the idea of competing empires and 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 playing people off of one another that was that was kind of his world uh, and he was exceedingly good at it um, so I think he uh, he comes off a little bit uh, misunderstood I would say in in the musical but it's a musical and so I don't I don't expect it to be a hundred percent you know uh, accurate on the facts I mean yeah you know, it, it is a creative, uh, it's, a, it's just a creative genius that you see a play there, right? Um, Hamilton also, as someone who studied a lot of Hamilton, the Hamilton we see there is, is deeply romanticized. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, you could talk, for instance, about like his, his relationship with women. Um, I think we get a, a, a narrow slice of that in, in the musical. Yeah. Um, and then the broader political economy, the kind of monarch worship, you know, that kind of stuff so is not stuff I personally like. Maybe some people do, uh, given the times we live in, maybe more people like it than they realize. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's that with, with that, uh, you know, Burr, Burr, I don't like Aaron Burr as a historical figure. I don't like many historical figures now that I think about it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, I'll, I'll leave Burr there for the moment. I, no, I, I think just, it's I, I fair to say that, like, I just want to, because I, like, I think that's the, that for me was the use of the musical. As someone who, like, mm. had to read a lot of the Federalist Papers and had to study a lot of Hamilton before I ended up watching the musical, I still like Hamilton, but not as, like, um, oh, man, I want to meet Hamilton type person. More, like, as people today enjoy reading about uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, you know, other horrible people from history. Yeah. More like it's just, it's fascinating to see how... Uh, how this person gets to be so revered and then like fall so quickly. But if you read like, um, if you read Joanne Freeman or if you see a Joanne Freeman interview or anybody else talking about Hamilton, um, just like you, they sort of agree. He was sort of a jerk. He was like pretty big jerk during his time. Uh, but that's why the musical is really funny because it shows Madison and Jefferson as like equally big jerks. I, I just, I think there's like many levels to the musical. And it's not just like this really frustrating romanticization, which it is when you watch it. So the the romance thing uh, with Hamilton it bothers me a little less. I'm not sure why, but the Jefferson thing. Well, even when I was in in high school, I remember being like really upset about Jefferson worship. Uh, I just mm. couldn't understand it. Um, and then it got worse when I started studying him as a grad student uh, and getting into his presidency because I was like this didn't go well at all. You know, this, was, <laughs> this is not what I was told. Um, but there is, in fact, I mean, there, you know, people love Jefferson, um, less so in the general public, where I think he's been, he's been, uh, it lost his place in the pantheon a little bit. But in, in academic circles, there are definitely 
uh, people who are, who are still interested in the Jeffersonian tradition, and this more in political science than history, I think. And um, I find it weird um, because there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the Jeffersonian tradition for me that's not part of uh, limited government, for instance. Yeah. Wait, so okay. quick question. Sorry, but like speaking of Hamilton and speaking of, of history, as someone who studies legal history and like, and you did study the history of, of taxation uh, and specifically like the early federal government, do you think like the Hamiltonian state succeeded? Like, do we, do we, did we have a Hamiltonian mm -hmm. state or have we like, uh, has it broken down? Oh yeah, sure. I think we do. Um, yeah. The, in fact, it's one of the things that I, in the book, I kind of say that uh, Jefferson wins the battle, Hamilton wins the war uh, because, yeah. um, well, Hamilton also dies, so there's that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the system that Hamilton really puts together by himself, and there's a lot of chicanery there, um, he, it lasts through much of the 19th century. Uh, and it's really not until you get the income tax that the system that he puts together starts to dissipate. And even if you read congressional hearings and the, after the New Deal, uh, the Hoover Commission, things like that, people are like, why do we still have this arcane custom system? Like, where, why is this still here? It makes no sense. Uh, and and it, it's all very 19th century. So in that sense, I think, yes. And then also the broader, the political economy idea that he has, right? Where, uh, you know, you use a deficit uh, you use a debt rather to finance expansion um, seems to be a pretty core principle of, of how the United States works, at least, and, and a lot of countries. Uh, and we now, the United States likes to export that concept, right, through the IMF and other institutions to tell other countries to do that. So I, I definitely think there's something there. Um, you know, early modernists would, would uh, lampoon me for saying that, saying Hamilton was just stealing it all from um, from the Glorious Revolution, and I get that, and he was. Uh, <laughs> it was all deeply derivative. Uh, Steve Pinkett, if you're watching, um, you were right. <laughs> um, so staying with, with Hamilton for just one more question, um, and then I, then I promise we'll move on. Um, well, two things actually related to Hamilton is, is that one, we have a lot of comments and questions saying that you're totally wrong about musicals. They're amazing, including one of your graduate students, apparently. So I'll yeah. let you figure out who that is. Um, <laughs> and you can, you can deal with that uh, like, like offline. But, um, <laughs> but, but secondly, kind of related to that, it's something you mentioned is about, like, you, not liking Burr and not liking Hamilton. I think that, that that's, a, that's something that historians have to deal with kind of all the time, isn't it? Is that people think that we're, we're kind of in love or, or we respect the people we're studying instead of just finding them interesting in some way, which is a very different thing than actually liking them. Um, and so one of the questions kind of related to that was, how does this, like, does this kind of put into perspective, like as a historian of, of early America, that this, this conversation is more public conversation about monuments? about um, you know, how we think about both the founders, but also you know, leaving aside the Confederates who were, were all traitors, um, but, but especially like the founders, right? Like people like Jefferson, people like Washington and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's a problem, uh, but I think it's a good problem because you can okay. really work both sides of it as a historian, right? If you're able to say, you know, these characters were incredibly complicated. And you might think you know everything there is to know about George Washington, right? But did you know he was like super into etiquette? And somebody will be like, really? Super into etiquette? Um, so there's always ways to take figures who are people think they, they know uh, and to add complexity to them and to add twists and turns. Um, you know, occasionally that gets tougher. I think someone like Andrew Jackson, I have a real problem saying anything that would be construed as, you know, complimentary Respectful. about um yeah i mean he didn't let south carolina secede um the first time they tried but uh, <laughs> the one nice thing you can say about yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much all you got um you know so uh yeah i don't in that sense i think it's more of an opportunity um and the the, the issue we were talking about earlier about more popular um a text aimed at more popular audiences. Um, they provide a low hanging fruit to some extent for us to, to pick up on. The, the problem is then working that into very complicated stories that we're trying to tell. Um, but there, I think that, you know, 
again, we were mentioning earlier, but the, the world of op-eds and kind of color pieces, right, uh, that we are now able to place in more, uh, in venues that have a broader reach, um, give us a bit of an entree to, to start discussing these things. So, yeah. Yeah, having these public conversations, I think, is, is incredibly important, not just, you know, kind of this thing right here, but in, in these, these other venues, so. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Um, and you're starting um, to see actually, like even at academic conferences, um, when they, you know, were meeting in person way back when. <laughs> like, remember that? Ago, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I started noticing more and more people who are not, uh, who were neither calling themselves independent scholars, uh, nor were uh, they random people who happened to be in that hotel. They were there because they wanted to be. Uh, they'd seen something yeah. like that and, you know, they were interested. And a lot of it probably flew over their heads or was boring, but they were there. And I think that's something, um, you know, less so at legal history, which tends to be pretty, pretty niche audience. But, um, but early Republic, uh, def you know, you definitely see some people who you don't recognize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think one thing that's like really true when it comes to mythologizing is that we don't just mythologize people like the founding fathers. We also mythologize, mythologize people who maybe done you know a couple of good things and then we just take it to the extreme like a really good example is, is lincoln right mm -hmm. um so recently because of juneteenth everyone was talking about this article or a couple of op-eds that were published by really important um people i think like jamel Bowie, adam server they pointed out that enslaved people freed themselves right it wasn't just lincoln it wasn't yeah. just the 13th amendment so one a couple of people have asked you know what's your opinion on the movie lincoln specifically like it's based on team of rivals but more generally what's your opinion on how we mythologize Lincoln. Um, and then based on that question, you're working on how policing sort of can be traced back to Jim Crow era stuff and that can be traced back to slavery. What's what are like a couple of quick examples that you see in contemporary policing that you that you saw when you're looking at Jim Crow era and the slavery era? Those are my last two questions. All right. So Lincoln's a it's a fascinating one. Um, you know, I think Lincoln gives us a lot in terms of uh, language, in terms of um, the kind of elite world of politics um, and law. Uh, I am much more aligned with the, sla the slaves, enslaved people freed themselves view than Lincoln freed the slaves view. Uh, because again, it goes back to the kind of methodological point I was making earlier, where I do see this this significant disjuncture between what's happening in Washington, D.C., um, even when we're talking about the 14th Amendment, right, um, uh, and what's happening on the ground, so to speak. So, um, you know, if you look at how the Emancipation Proclamation, for instance, is um, administered, right, it's an enormous mess. And without uh, people who are uh, formerly enslaved pressing claims for their own freedom, um, that don't have to do with uh, being part of the Union Army, for instance, uh, it, it doesn't end up um, being a form of freedom uh, for a lot of people. Uh, fast forward beyond Lincoln then to what I was mentioning, the 14th Amendment, right? We all act now like, uh, you know, the whole thing of Reconstruction being this unfulfilled revolution um, as, as if it was a moment gone awry, but for me, it's entirely un unsurprising that you would have uh, white vigilantes who are sabotaging it at every step of the way, because I mean, the previous several hundred years had sort of established the ground for that. Like a, a formal amendment on, on a constitution isn't going to change that then mm -hmm. overnight and to some extent later into the present, right? So, um, you know, Lincoln in that sense, if you contextualize him in, in that way, yes, in terms of the, the, the formal, uh, the world of formal law, uh, absolutely, you know, undoubtedly pivotal, influential, the crux of an enormous turn um, in American history. But, um, you know, you ask the people who are subject to a lot of the forces that were both unleashed, constrained, um, and, and whatnot at the time, and I'm not sure they would have seen Lincoln as the great protector uh, in the way that we tend to mythologize him now. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, it's hard for me to find, Lincoln is a very complicated figure in terms of his own engagement with, with African-Americans, with slavery, 
But putting all that aside and just looking at his presidency, you know, he wants to come into office and make peace with the Confederates, with the soon-to-be Confederates, rather, right? He says in his first inaugural, I, you guys can keep your whatever you want to keep. I'm not going to, you know, change too much radically. Uh, they're already on the path to doing to going where they're going. So, um, you know, I, I don't mythologize him. I don't see him in the same grand light that, that others do, but um, definitely yeah, very important in the formal, um, the world of formal law. Um, the uh, other question you asked about policing, right? So to me, this is a story of accretion over time. Uh, and what we have to borrow post-structural language here, and I apologize to my one grad student who's here for subjecting you to more of this, but um, <laughs> there is what we might call a gaze, I think, which is created over time. And you know, sociological literature will call it structural racism. Um, and the critical legal studies literature you mentioned earlier also will, will go there, right? But I think one of the, the problems in the literature has been an inability to sort of unpack what that means um, in everyday life, what structural means in everyday. And, you know, this is a common historiographic problem, right, between structure agency. Um, but to me, uh, it is undeniable that you see the, the, the amount of energy that is poured into laws over time to regulate the movement of people of color uh, that continues then into Reconstruction, Jim Crow, that continues through the Progressive Era into the New Deal. I mean, it just never goes away. So for me, it's this incredible story of continuity with points of contingency along the way. But the fact that, you know, policing manuals in the 20th century are talking about the, quote, Negro problem, unquote, in very similar ways to people talking about it in the 1878, to me suggests more than rhetorical equivalence that there is a, a sort of persistence over time. Um, so, so that continuity, um, read about policing, about the, 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 the equivalence between, I mean, like obviously when historians say like, you know, and again, it's kind of coming back to the relevance thing, right? About this, this, this continuity is, is the thing that happened in the 19th century is not the same as what happens now, right? So, so one of the things that I think people are, are kind of curious about is about, you know, the relation about this historical understanding of policing, like, like, how is it, how is it different though? Like, how do you, how do you understand that? Like, it's, it's really important to understand the kind of the deep roots of this problem related to policing, for example, but, but understand that this has a particular historical valence that, that matters in the here and now in this particular way. Yeah, uh, by no means do I want to equate what's happening today to what was happening mm. uh, in, in, you know, uh, the 1880s, um, because they're not even close. Uh, but I do think, if we think about legacies, lineages, right, um, I, I think that there is, oftentimes the story is a contingent one. It might be con continuous over time, but there's a great deal of contingency worked into it. Um, there are paths not taken, for instance. There are moments of incredible momentous change. Um, there are moments of apparent momentous change, which, which aren't. You know, if you look at how historians now understand the uh, um, Miranda versus Arizona case, right, which was supposed to be this watershed moment for rights um, uh, when it came to policing. Now people look at it and say, hmm, the fact that uh, this is not administered evenly or widely for that matter uh, is, is a real issue. The same would go for the right to a public defender that was supposed to sort of, you know, level the playing field between someone who's accused of a crime and those, the accusers. And simply, you know, we know for a fact that that's not how it has worked over time. If you go to a law school class, constitutional law, they'll tell you Gideon v. Wainwright is one of the most important cases to ever happen. But, you know, you go to a, a a county jail and, and, and tell them the same thing. I'm sure they'll laugh at you. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult answer because uh, I'm trying to, to work sort of both contingency and continuity into, yeah. the, into it. But I do think that's the way it works. And like I, I used the word legacies before, and that's really how I see it. Uh, so much has happened in terms of you know, you want to think about the kind of technology available to police now that wasn't available 100 years ago that makes the kind of things they wanna do uh, in a lot of ways easier. Um, does that mean that they're going to use technology for racial purposes? Not necessarily, 
but is that how it has worked in, in the last 20 years? Probably. Um, and so it's hard not to see these, these continu continuities uh, over time. Uh, and I'm, one of the challenges of the book project right now is not over, over egging that, you know, uh, and, and finding the moments where it simply isn't what it appears to be. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, uh, as someone new to 20th century research, that's a bit of a challenge, but. Um, yeah. Sure. But your, your discussion about like laws and Supreme Court cases versus how they're enforced, like reminds me of, of, of um, uh, I don't know if people have read this, Laura Edwards' book, uh, The People and Their Peace. Right. Yeah. She talks about South Carolina in her book. And mainly the point she's making is that even though there are changes at the federal level or even at the state level, it's how local forces enforce these laws and create laws of their own that are more important to understanding legal culture than like a Supreme Court case. And I think that's what makes legal history so useful to students, right, is to realize that it's not just that the 13th Amendment was a thing, it's more about how that 13th Amendment is reacted to and enforced across all these different states. 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, right? Um, and I think a really great example is everyone's talking about voting rights today. Mm -hmm. And one would think that from 1965 until, you know, C.J. Roberts destroyed voting rights, we would have proper voting rights, but we don't. There's still disenfranchisement on, on so many different ways. Um, everyone's talking about mail-in voting now. And I recently learned that like uh, African-Americans are much more likely to have their mail-in ballots discarded than white voters. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's like so many levels where like you have to recognize that just because a law is passed does not mean it's enforced equally. And I think that's a, looking at it through the lens of slavery and, and, white, and white labor is a really fascinating way to, to do that. That is probably the, the key methodological thing in all my work is, is, is trying to look at things as they play out as opposed to, I almost assume that they don't work the way they're supposed to. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, read into that as you may. Um, but uh, I wanted to convey a quick story. Uh, this is when I was adjuncting the first time, a uh, course on legal history. And I really did a poor job of explaining a lot of the kind of institutions and the background. And a student asked me in an email, you know, is it a prerequisite to being the, a judge on the Supreme Court that your initials have to be CJ? And I didn't think about what they, I was like, what is this person talking about? Then I realized that I had just not explained that it was Chief Justice in the in the. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, when I say C.J. Roberts, I mean Chief Justice Roberts. Yes, no, but that as soon as you said that, I thought, oh, you know, this is reminded me very much of that moment. Um, so, yeah, uh, so speaking of um, C.J. Roberts, who. I will say that I thought his name was CJ until just this moment. Um, is that because um, <laughs> it was John, right? Like I thought maybe there's like a C in front, like it was Christopher John. Or, I don't know. Anyway, I'm a medievalist. Leave me alone. Um, is uh, <laughs> is is so you know as a historian of the American Republic, as a legal historian, like I mean, you know, you, you, you've you've talked and and I'll reveal a little bit of kind of our conversations beforehand. Is that you, you have some some involvement in in things that are kind of going on in today's world, right, related to the current president and stuff like that. Um, so my first question is is how do you pronounce a Moulamont? Second, what is an Moulamont? And third, what is your involvement in this question of a Moulamont? Ah, yes. Yeah. So uh, it would be pronounced uh, emolument would be the uh, okay. American, American version. Uh, um, it is the, the answer to the second question, what is it, is basically the, what is being uh, adjudicated by the courts. Um, okay. So, you know, our brief, uh, I'm part of a group of historians uh, who's written a brief, and there's another group um, who have written a, a, a brief very much arguing the opposite point, uh, whether or not the term should be uh, understood very, very narrowly as a uh, profit arising from office, uh, or whether it should be more broadly construed. Uh, but basically, it was a term uh, that was used in um, the early modern world uh, into uh, into early America that denoted uh, some sort of profit from either office uh, or, okay. or connection to office. Um, and my colleague uh, in on the brief, uh, John McHale at uh, Georgetown Law Center has written 
um, very authoritatively about uh, the kind of philological work that he did. So you might be interested in that. Um, but uh, really, really fascinating stuff he's done with databases and, and that kind of work. So uh, yeah, that's the short answer. Uh, and then I got involved in it um, because uh, I thought it was interesting. Um, I was itching for an outlet perhaps to um, to uh, uh, express some of my frustration with the current uh, political environment um, and I thought I was having studied corruption and things like that in the earlier public I thought I was I was qualified to do it um, I working with the folks that we, I did for that and it's kind of an ongoing thing but uh, fairly awestruck by their by their genius frankly um, Jack Rakoff uh, Simon Cern John McHale, Jed Sugarman are all enormous. I mean, I feel like when I look back at my, at my contributions compared to theirs, it's, 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 I feel bad like that my name is on it next to theirs because I'm like, yeah, you guys did your thing. You said I, Jack Rakoff and I'm starstruck. I, I, sorry, I love Jack Rakoff. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I made sure that, you know, we had the page number in debt correct and things like that, but they, they, <laughs> uh, um, they were the real brains behind the operation. So uh, particularly Jed uh, Sugarman has been the real uh, driving force behind it. So. But yeah, I mean, my interest in it is um, because I think that the argument the Department of Justice is making about what constitutes corruption is frankly silly. And, um, and just not, it's not what, what, if they're going to use the originalist interpretation of the, of the Constitution, which I don't particularly think is the way to go, but if they're going to do that, they may as well get it right. I don't think they have. I think they've, they've really um, made it very self-serving in how they framed it. So. That's kind of how I got involved with it. It is uh, anyone who ends up working on these amicus briefs, it is an enormous amount of time and effort and frustration and whatnot. Um, so uh, I did a panel on this, uh, I think ASLH a couple years back where that was the general sentiment among all the participants where we're like, wow, this is hard and we're all tired. Uh, <laughs> but, um, That's like the historian's refrain, like this is hard and we're all tired. Yes. So is it? I remember the amicus brief that was for Oberfeld, and it was like really, really good and really useful. And I had to like reread it a, a couple of months ago. Um, but yeah, I can I can see how much work it is because it was very long, very intense. I was yeah. at um, George Chauncey was still at Chicago when um, when the same sex marriage. Uh, oh, excuse me, when Lawrence Texas Lawrence v. Texas uh, was um, in front of the court, and he was working on the the big brief. And I, you know, I didn't have any involvement uh, at that point. I was, I was just working in the office outside, but, um, you know, you could see definitely just the stakes, enormous stakes of that kind of, of history uh, and also the, the importance of it. So um, in that sense, uh, there is a responsibility to some extent for historians to, I think, when called upon, be able to do that kind of work. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's difficult to, to say when that'll happen for a lot of issues, but um, I, hope, uh, I hope it's at least made uh, a splash, uh, our argument. I think it has. It's convinced a few courts over the, along the way, but um, hopefully there's one, one big one possibly left. So hopefully uh, uh, the CJ that we were mentioning earlier would, would <laughs> like what we have to say. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I'm looking at the time. We're, we're running out of time, and I, I can't think of a better way to end, honestly, than just when historians actually have something to say about the present. And this isn't necessary that every historian will have, um, you know, a particular uh, moment that they have to intervene in. But when it does happen, I think historians are, are ready. And this is this has been a theme, not just of today, but of all the conversations that we've been having that we're willing to have these conversations and we have something to say like i mean we, we know these things and that we we're, we're experts on this this material so um i do want to also congratulate gautam who is a big liverpool fan um with liverpool taking the the apl title i want to acknowledge that um since he's yeah, there you go he's wearing his he's wearing his shirt i feel like we can't move past that uh but thank you everyone for joining us thank you so much for to, to professor gautam ralph for, for joining us tonight um next week we're going to be talking with uh, joanne freeman um, from yale we'll be talking more about hamilton so bring more of your Hamilton questions back to drinking with historians. Um, until then, thank you on behalf of Varsha and me and uh, Professor Rao. Um, cheers. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. It's been great. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.